if you set up your estate and succession plan and just give an equal amount to everybody, you're asking for your children to basically fight the rest of their life. Coming up on episode 344 of The Modern Acre, we're talking why your farm or family business needs to have a succession plan. The Modern Acre podcast explores the latest in business, investing, technology, and sustainability in agriculture, and we're your hosts, Tyler and Tim Nuss. If you'd like to dig deeper with The Modern Acre, be sure to check out our membership community, The Modern Acre Co-op. The Modern Acre podcast is presented by Pinion. In today's challenging ag environment, the success of a farm rises and falls based on making sound decisions. Pinion advisors recommend evaluating your farm data regularly to maximize profits and identify threats to your bottom line. If you don't have time or resources, Pinion can help. Farmers have entrusted Pinion with their businesses for 90 years. From ag-focused tax and accounting strategy, legacy planning, and FSA program guidance, to business management, land advisory, sustainability, and more. Explore your options at pinionglobal.com. Tim, last week we talked about sponsorships at World Agritech, and we mentioned how the Wi-Fi sponsor hat was the best sponsorship to get because you're one of one. You're not one of 50 on you know of the sponsors of the show you have to enter the name of the company the sponsor as the wi-fi password and we felt like that was the best bang for your buck here at the modern acre tim we only have one sponsor because we don't want to dilute the sponsorship of the modern acre podcast one of the most exclusive sponsorships available in agriculture in all in all seriousness tim we're super excited to, to partner with pinion our sponsor this quarter. We use Pinion's services, accounting services, financial services on our farm. And we're super excited to have a conversation today with another kind of service that Pinion provides as far as estate and succession planning. A boring topic you may think, but this conversation with Kevin, Tim, was awesome. Yeah, it was super fun talking with Kevin, just how plugged in he is to the policy side of this on how different administrations view kind of wealth taxes, inheritance taxes, and what that means for family farms. And so Kevin really works with growers all across the U.S. of different sizes and operations and really figures out the best plan for them and makes sure that they're planning correctly because something that often happens in in farming businesses where you just kind of don't think about it, you punt it down the road, and then when something happens, you've got a, a big problem to solve. So getting ahead of that and being proactive is a super key part of the process. This was really strategic. There was a lot of great insight in here that, Tim, I think we're going to apply in our conversations around the the family business, right? And I think will be interesting for anyone who's involved in farming, or even if you just have a, a family small business in the ag industry, it doesn't, this does, this isn't exclusive to farms, but really all small businesses that have to think about succession planning. So you guys are going to love it. Let's jump in with what's top of mind for Kevin. Succession and estate planning has become a hot topic again after it kind of died down after the 2016 elections. President Trump and his administration gave us all a big Christmas present in 2017 by doubling the exemption. And I think that forced or allowed people to stop thinking about a succession planning because in general, people get hung up on the number, which is a terrible reason to do succession planning, by the way. But, you know, that that law is set to sunset at the end of 2025. And by operational law, the exemption for federal state tax purposes will revert back to $5 million per person. And I think that has a lot of people interested in uh, maybe starting to think about their succession plan again, worried about uh, are they going to have an estate tax issue. And as we see the drive up in the prices of land across the country, especially in the ag industry, um, people are starting to get a little nervous around, hey, I think I might have an estate tax problem, something I haven't had to think about for eight years. Can you break that down a little bit for us? Basically, what happened in 2017 is you're saying that the amount, the exemption before you're taxed on additional amount was was doubled, and that basically created a a bigger margin for people to work with. Is that am I understanding that correctly? 
Yeah. So the way our estate tax system, federal estate tax system works is, is every administration tends to change it, uh, the rules. And so, you know, it was pretty stable in the in the 1990s under under uh, President Clinton, where the exemption amount, meaning the amount you could either give away while you're alive or die with, um, the exemption amount was around six hundred to seven hundred thousand dollars a person during that decade. And then over that, the estate tax rate kicked in at about fifty five percent, which has been historically the, the tax rate, fifty five percent. Um, we had a lot of talk in the early 2000s about eliminating the death tax. It got a moniker called the death tax, right? It's something like Darth Vader, right? It's a terrible thing. So um, the Republicans really pushed to eliminate all estate tax. Uh, when they finally had the votes to do it, Katrina, Hurricane Katrina hit that next weekend. So they never even voted on it because they knew the federal government was going to have to pay that bill, right? And if you've been to New Orleans recently, it's still not cleaned up. So um, we're still paying that bill. So, you know, they never eliminated the estate tax. Um, and, and, and then when President Obama came into office, it was supposed to revert back to a million dollars a person. And he actually, through some negotiations with the Republicans, he actually increased it to five million dollars per person. So we had this huge gift even from Obama back in 2009 um, to do uh, to allow people to either die or pass away with $5 million of exemption. People were starting to get concerned about that number throughout his administration because when the Republicans didn't leave, li live up to their end of the agreement, he started talking about rolling that back to $3.5 million. And that's what Hillary was going to do if she became president. She talked a lot about the exemption should be around $3.5 million. Well, she obviously didn't win. Uh, Trump came into office. He doubled the five to $10 million in 2017 and then put it on an inflation adjuster. We've never seen that before either. So now everybody got a $10 million exemption in 2017 and then adjusted for inflation each year. So now we're up to $13.6 million a person. And if you're lucky enough to have found someone you want to be married to and live with, you're over $27 million. Mm. That, doesn't, that, that covers a lot of people. That's good Word. news and bad news. The good news is you probably don't have an estate tax problem. The bad news is you're probably not doing succession planning, which is even more important, especially in the ag community. Um, because the Republicans in 2017 did not have enough votes to get that through the Senate without um, invoking cloture, which means that they could have just filibustered all night long or all week long, they decided that they were just going to pass it under a provision that allowed it to have to sunset after a period of time. So it only was at that enhanced number for eight years, which means at the end of 2025, it has to go back to the old law which is the $5 million exemption. Did that make sense? It does. And I have a, a follow-up for you. So it was, it was kind of dubbed the death tax, but you had mentioned that this can be exchange hands pre-death. So, so what's the difference between this and like the annual gifting limit? Great question. So up until 1976, we had no gifting program actually. So even though the exemption per person up till 1976 was only $50,000 a person, Nobody paid a state tax because on your deathbed, you could just give everything away because there was no gift tax system. Uh, President Ford, on his way out of office, kind of married those two systems together and basically said you could either gift it while you're alive or a portion. And whatever you don't gift, you can carry over and, and have it as an exemption when you pass away. And then he doubled it to $100,000. Um, the annual gifting allows for this year up to $18,000 of additional gifting before you even have to file a gift tax return or bite into your exclusion amount, that federal exclusion amount. So you can, you can put your gifting on steroids by using some creative strategies to discount some of that gifting. And really, instead of gifting $18,000, you can be gifting thirty and $40,000 per person per beneficiary. So each person can gift to each beneficiary up to $18,000 this year before you even have to file a gift tax return or eat into your exemption, which is 13.6 this year, if that makes sense. It does. It does. Excited okay. to, to dive deeper into this. But before we do, sure. Kevin, maybe let's learn a little bit more about your background, what led you into to the space in general. Yeah. So I... Um, I, I uh, started out as an accountant many years ago, and then 30 years ago, I, I got my law degree. And when I started with then Kennedy & Co., that was the precursor to Pinion, 
we, we uh, had a lot of ag clients and I was spending a lot of time trying to keep family farms together. And I was in the courtroom already because either somebody died with an estate tax problem or somebody got divorced. And now we're in a situation where do we have to sell the land in order to either pay off an outlaw or write a check to the government? And how do we keep this together? Because uh, dad didn't have a plan. You know, that a lot of a lot of the older farmers just refused to admit they were ever going to die. So there was not a lot of planning back then. And so I spent my first seven, eight years fighting in courts, trying to keep family farms together with very little success, to be honest with you. And it was very frustrating. So I decided, um, you know, 15, 17 years ago to become much more proactive. And so I go around the country speaking at a lot of ag seminars about how to have some type of a plan in place in order for this dilemma not to happen. And, and what breaks my heart is that this huge exemption has allowed families to think they don't need to have a plan. So I'm starting to get pulled into a lot more of those family dynamics where dad doesn't have a plan. He died unexpectedly. And now the family doesn't know what's supposed to happen. And, and they're asking me to come try to solve the problem. Because once you start bringing in attorneys, um, it, 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 it doesn't end prettily. It does not end in a pretty situation because um, all the beneficiaries think fair and equal or completely different to them. So uh, so that's where my passion comes from. And I actually, our family lost their family farm way back in the 80s up in Pennsylvania. My grandfather's children did not want a family farm. So he decided he better sell it off in order to pay because the property taxes were getting higher. Well, sadly, I have 25 first cousins and that's where we used to get together every year. And without a family farm, nobody gets together anymore. And so uh, I, I'm very passionate about trying to keep this family farm intact. It doesn't mean somebody has to farm, but if you can keep the land base, it, you know, it can skip a generation. Somebody gets excited about coming back, but it's certainly a place for people to meet and, and congregate. And if, if the right answer is to finally sell it, so be it. I just don't want it sold because somebody doesn't have a plan in place. So cool. What What a cool job. It's really cool in your position to have, you know, what you're working on have such meaning. Right. I mean, I think that's really, really cool. And just supporting American agriculture is and farmers is, is, is pretty sweet to see. So, OK, well, we got to dig into this um, and, and hear, hear more about how you're thinking about this. It sounds like if I could take one thing away from what you've already said um, and then we can kind of jump into some more details is it's about being proactive. Right. Is, that's kind of what I'm hearing when, you know, this is something that our family has thought a lot about our dad's dad passed away unexpectedly. And, and our dad kind of had to figure it out and try to figure out how to, how to keep the farm and grow the farm, which he was able to do, but there wasn't that great plan in place. And so now the next generation, we have three boys, we're talking to our dad about this and he is, you know, much more wants to help make sure that there's a, a, a plan in place, but it's something that we're having, you know, ongoing active conversations around, um, just given, you know, given the dynamic of everything. And I, what I find really interesting is our, our family, for the most part, really gets along and is aligned on just roles and responsibilities and, and everything related to that. But I know there's some instances um, in, in a lot of families where you don't have that alignment, right? Um, and that creates a challenge. So I would love to just kind of hear your, your general strategy around like how to approach this. What are the, the big things to think about for farmers and families listening to this podcast? Like what would be, what would be some starting points? Yeah. So if you can get dad over the hurdle of his mortality, you know, that's, that's a tough hurdle to get over. That's actually like, it's the opposite issue with our dad. Uh, he like casually just throws out, oh, when I croak, he, he's, like, <laughs> he, he's way too lighthearted about it. And we're like, dad, can you just like chill out and uh, not, not make those comments? So it, yeah, we have the opposite problem with our dad. He, he's very comfortable, uh, <laughs> comfortable with, with having to. Having that conversation. <laughs> well, and then Tyler, the, always the next thing is the control issue, right? Yeah. Ag producers are very controlling. Uh, probably not the best communicators, but it doesn't sound like your family has that problem. I would say 80% of the families I meet with, that that is the first two hurdles to get over. Dad doesn't really want to think about the next generation, you know, notwithstanding the fact that, that that he had to go through everything he did when he inherited it. So, you know, for, for most of our history, ag was in a survival mode. It was just in a survival mode, you know, because the 80s showed us that you could lose a farm like that. And then coming out of that into the 90s and, and, and more recently, I mean, you just had to find a way to survive. 
Now it feels like in a blink of an eye, these family businesses, small family businesses are no longer small family businesses. Now they're worth tens of millions of dollars, you know, even if you own a few hundred or thousand of acres, depending on where it is. And it's not just one family that is dependent upon it. It's usually multiple families that are dependent upon the ability for this farm to continue to go on. And you have employees that are dependent upon you. So you have to look at this in a whole different way now. I mean, this is a large business um, for most people. I mean, it's become a large business. And as we continue to see the consolidation of family of farms, because um, it's going to continue to happen. There's no way to stop the consolidation. It is not a lifestyle for a lot of people, um, especially throughout the Midwest. Uh, kids are moving on, going to college. Doesn't mean they don't want to be landowners, but they don't want to go back and operate the family farm anymore. Um, so we are seeing a lot of consolidation and we'll continue to see that. And so these farms that are still continuing to go on are getting larger and larger and they have to be approached a little differently than any other type of business. And what I mean by that, Tyler, is, is if you set up your estate and succession plan and just give an equal amount to everybody, you're asking for your children to basically fight the rest of their life because the off-farm heirs are never going to say to you, Tyler, oh yeah, go buy a million dollar combine. I think that's a great idea, even though I haven't been on vacation in 10 years. And even if your loving sister or brother doesn't say that to you, they're going to marry somebody that is not going to have your best interest at heart. And that's where this starts to come apart is they're in their ears all the time saying, wow, do you think this is fair to you? They're going to talk to an attorney. They're going to talk to somebody that's going to eventually say to them, I'm not sure you got what's your, what is fair to you. Um, and that starts the whole conversation of, do I need to go talk to an attorney then? Yeah. So Kevin, where does this process start for you? Pinion obviously does a lot of CPA work. That's how we originally got in touch with Pinion was through the, the CPA relationship. We've since added on subsequent business services. Is this a like consulting service that Pinion offers or like how does this work in the overall Pinion ecosystem? Yeah, absolutely. So how we usually begin this process is I do a lot of speaking. And so people come up and they say, hey, can I just sit down with you for a few hours? And I always like to come out to the farm. So that that's usually where it begins is I like to come out and see the farm. Sometimes it makes sense to meet somewhere else. And I usually bring, a, you know, several other people with me. I'm an attorney now. I don't, I wouldn't, you wouldn't want me doing your tax return. So um, I, I'm a few years removed from that, but I usually bring an accountant out with me and we like to sit down. And the most important thing is to start talking about your goals. What do you guys want to accomplish with this generation and the next generation? And usually mom and dad will have different goals than the next generation. And that's fine. I would rather know everything that people were thinking so that we can really come up with a comprehensive plan. So that's really the starting point, Tim, is, is to sit down and have that conversation around what are the goals for this generation? Does dad ever want to retire? Uh, does dad want to die on a tractor? What are the next, you know, what does the next generation think they want to do? Um, and once you start talking about those goals, then looking at tax returns, financial information, legal documents, that's really the next phase. And we do call this a phase one. We enter into some type of a phase one agreement where we will analyze after learning all of your goals and, and what you, the family wants to accomplish and the history. The history is very important. I highly recommend every family farm that has at least two or three generations that somebody starts documenting or recording the history because that is so important to go back and remember, why are we doing this again? Um, what has what some of these generations gone through? But as we gather that information in that phase one, it really helps us see, are you on the right path? What else do you have to do? And that's where we really try to uh, analyze and come up with some options and solutions to meeting your goals. What do you need to do financially? What do you need to do organizationally? What do you need to do legally? And we really take that comprehensive approach as to what you need to start putting in place to, to meet your, the family goals. Kevin, could you give us like an example or a case study of, you know, a farm family that you worked with and how, how you kind of came up with a creative solution? Maybe it was a, a big challenge with siblings or, you know, some, some particular challenge. Yes, absolutely. And, and they all start with everybody wanting to get all of the angst off their chest. So the first hour is always spent t talking about how somebody else has wronged them, right? So you, you have, so there's a little bit of that, uh, you know, just being a psychoanalyst or a therapist in some of this, uh, which I enjoy and appreciate also. I come from a big family, so there's a lot of dynamics in play. And so, you know, there's a, I would say 
this year in particular, I'm hearing a lot of those angst stories about that somebody died unexpectedly and the cousins have no idea what my uncle and father wanted to take place. And so we sit down and talk about, is this, is, is this even solvable? Do, do we have some of the same goals in place? Does anybody want to even come back? So we met with a family just recently down in Arkansas. And, it, and we had met with them several years ago. And they just keep growing and growing because they're buying more land. Land values go up. And they all their kids went away to college. One was going to be an attorney. Another one was going to be a, a sports consultant. And they realized after a while that coming back to the farm might be the best answer. Real world isn't always so much fun. And, and what they knew all their life was the family farm. And their dad and uncle made it look pretty pretty enjoyable. So it was really sitting down with them and talking about how do we bring that next generation in that you were never planning on bringing in at the dad and uncle level. Um, I mean, they're excited about it, but they have a lot of angst because an apprehension because they never considered that these kids would want to come back. And so it's really sitting down and talking about what do you want this to look like in 10 years, 20 years, and then talking to the next generation saying, what do you want this to look like in 30 or 40 years? And you know, it took several meetings, but they started having mutual goals. Um, you can help make them see the other one's point of view. A lot of times what happens first is everybody starts saying, well, I don't know. Who, I don't know who to give the land to and I don't know who to give the operations to. And if you start there, you'll never have a succession plan. It'll take you five years to answer that question if you ever do. Because what I have also found out is that moms think differently than the, than the fathers. They they have watched this process. They've they've watched dad miss birthdays, baseball games, maybe some anniversaries, and they're pretty adamant that they want family harmony and they want to see this work because dad, grandpa, great grandpa have worked way too long and hard to keep this together. So dad may be a little flippant about, well, I'm just going to pass away and they're going to have to figure it out. That's what I had to do. I had to figure it out. And mom's like, no, 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 we're not doing that. <laughs> Kevin, you mentioned some mistakes that people made, like not being proactive in this process, kind of dividing the pie equally, creating tension there. Like any other like mistakes you see people when they're going down the path of estate planning that they should watch out for? There's a belief that any attorney can uh, create a good and successful estate plan for you. And there's a lot of great attorneys out there that are great at that. Family agriculture farming is different than any other kind of succession plan. It, it, you really have to hone in on what are the goals? What are we trying to accomplish? And in that process, you're, you're watching the dynamics and seeing how well do these people get along? Are they, are they really telling us the true story? Because what a lot of attorneys do, and this is a big, big mistake, is they just, you know, because the parents will just say, well, I don't know. Let's just, let's, uh, I have three kids. We'll just leave one third to everybody. And now all of a sudden, each one of the kids is a landowner and an operational owner. And they don't know how to operate. You know, there's at least one of the kids, if not two of them, that have, know nothing about farming. They may live states away. They have no interest. And now the one that stayed back and is farming is asking permission constantly on what to plant, when they can buy new equipment, when they sell, uh, you know, when they market. And so it creates a dynamic where they're just fighting constantly with their siblings. Um, so that is a terrible place to start when you just start dividing everything equally amongst your children, grandchildren. It will become a mess. Uh, a succession plan won't guarantee family harmony, but not having a succession plan will guarantee the opposite of that. The family will fight right away. And you've left them no alternative but to fight. And the other big mistake I see, Tim, is mom and dad then not communicating something to the children. You don't have to tell your kids everything. They don't need to know exactly what you're worth. The more you tell them, the better, the better the plan usually goes. But mom and dad need to know you have a plan because if you don't communicate something to them, they're just going to make up their own idea of what mom and dad might have wanted. And, and they're going to watch the actions more than anything else. And if they don't see that mom and dad are working cohesively about this, um, they're never going to really understand what mom and dad may want as far as a plan. So the, the, the communication is so key to at least let your kids know we have something in place and we and we want this to work. So let's let's at least have a conversation about how this may work. Kevin, you know, I think the common belief or understanding is that a lot of these, you know, retiring or aging farmers 
are, you know, they're just farming till they, till they die, like we mentioned. Um, and then, you know, then there's a state plan that goes to the kids, what have you. Are you seeing more scenarios with farmers that are being like bought out by their children or like how, 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 what, how are you seeing that in the market of a scenario where, you know, the farmer wants to exit the business in some capacity or, or get an influx of cash? How, how do you really think about like a mechanism to do that? Yeah. So in my experience, what I have found out works really well is that dad and mom do stay the landlords. So as I talked about earlier, is the worst thing you can do is give an equal portion of everything to your kids. The thing that works really well is to separate the operations from the land base. That way, only the children that are coming back to operate get the operational side. Everybody can be a landlord if they want. So dad and mom can stay landlords to the day they die and and then provide themselves some nice cash flow from that. But the other dirty little secret that nobody ever talks about is if dad is really doing good income tax planning and deferring and pushing the grain into the next year, he has no ability to ever retire short of paying a lot of taxes, right? But dad may want out someday. I mean, not everybody wants to die on a tractor. I agree. So we have created a strategy opinion where we allow dad to get bought out over time from the next generation, bring that next generation in, step up the basis of those operating assets so that then you can go sell your grain tax-free, basically, pay dad over time over the rest of his life, creates, and he pays that tax then over the next 20, 25 years at a much lower rate. So there is absolutely strategic ways to bring mom and dad in or out to leave them stay in a cash flow situation since this these are their assets and they do need to either retire or enjoy their their senior years. So yeah, there's a there's just some great strategies around that. And and those don't get talked enough about. I, I'll be honest with you. Uh, they're very sophisticated to implement, but every every ag producer I talk to, when I say there is a strat, I promise you we have a strategy if you ever want to retire, their eyes light up. They're like, oh, I was told I had to die with all these assets, you know. No, there is a strategy and, and it's pretty powerful because that step up a basis, if you, could, if you could step up the basis in a full year's crop and sell it without paying tax, think about how much cash flow that frees up for everybody to either pay off debt or to go buy more, some more land. The way land prices are going today, if the current, in this current generation, if you don't find a way to hang on to that asset, that family farm, this family will never be able to farm again. Land prices are way too high for somebody starting out to even think about going and buying 100 acres, much less 1,000 acres. So it is. this is the pivotal generation. Are we going to do right by family farmers and allow that these family land bases, this legacy, can stay intact? Or are we basically saying family farming is done in this country? And that makes me ill. So, I'm yeah, I want people to understand this is the pivotal generation to make this work. Kevin, what's a contrarian view you have within Food and Ag? You've been doing this quite a while and curious what you have a contrarian view about. So I hear too many stories in, in Ag more than anywhere else of, well, I'm not over the exemption, so I don't need an estate plan. And that nobody could tell you what the exemption is going to be tomorrow, next week, next year, the next administration. Nobody could tell you what your land's really worth or what it's going to be worth when you pass away. And that's the key is it's when you pass away, what's the exemption at the federal level and what is your asset base worth? And nobody knows the answer to that. So it's a terrible, when I hear attorneys say, tell their clients, well, you don't need an estate plan. You're not over the exemption. I, I think that's, I think that's malpractice because you may need, not need that aspect of an estate plan, but anybody in a business needs a succession plan. And that's not where they're making the distinction. That succession plan is so important. I sat on a panel right after the 2017 law was passed and there was four other attorneys and we went down the line and every attorney said, well, I'd I'd, I'd wait and see. You know, it was all ag, there's a thousand ag clients out or ag audience out in the, out out, out listening. And they all said, every, all four attorneys said, well, I'd wait and see what's going to happen with the estate tax law. I think this exemption is going to be a game changer for all you guys. So just wait and see. And they came to me and they said, well, I guess, Kevin, you agree with them. And I'm like, absolutely not. Ag people have to make decisions every single day, telling them to wait and see. You're asking them not to get in a car because I have clients and prospects that die in car accidents and COVID showed us that nobody's guaranteed a life. 
a farm business more than any other business in this country has to have a succession plan. Wait and see is the worst answer an attorney could give to a client. Love it. Love it. Well, Kevin, this has been awesome. Um, thanks for taking the time and really enlightening us on, on estate planning and succession planning for agriculture. It's been, it's been awesome. As we finish up, how can listeners get in touch and connect with you and Pinion? Yeah, so um, we, we have a great website, Pinion.com, and, and a lot of our phone numbers are listed there. I'm, I'm listed. I'm an owner of the company. So that's a, certainly a good way to get started. But I don't even mind giving out my cell phone number, to be honest with you. So I'm here in Denver, Colorado. I spend more time at the airport than anywhere else because I am flying 50 out of 52 weeks of the year. Uh, I would rather be on a farm and uh, meeting with with the ag producers than anything else. Don't tell my wife that. But anyway, so my cell phone number is 303-588-2654. I would love to talk to anybody that has a passion about wanting to keep their family farm intact or just has questions about it. And coming out and visiting the family farm is something that I always look forward to doing. So um, I appreciate and thank you for this opportunity to talk to your, your audience. Tyler, Tim, thank you very much. So Ty, what do you think? I, I, I feel like we could have gone longer with Kevin and got into more details of even our of our specific situation. I, I loved what he just said about, you know, focusing on being proactive, having a plan, and even as it relates to, hey, there's even mechanisms to cash out a retiring farmer, right? That their kids can find a way to buy them out, a win-win for everyone involved earlier being more proactive in the process. So I thought that was a great insight just on, on its own. That's what's one tactical thing I'll take away from this conversation. So big shout out to Pinion, our single sponsor of the podcast this quarter. We really appreciate them. If you guys haven't already, check out Pinion. They're there to support you in a number of different capacities. And if you want to dig into each of those, check out their website. It's linked in the show notes. We'd really appreciate you supporting Pinion. And thanks again for them supporting the show.